Hi, I'm Matthew Kelly, and welcome to Profoundly Human. We have a fascinating guest for you today. Matt Mayberry is a former Chicago Bears NFL player. He is a fantastic speaker and a great author. We're going to talk about all those topics. Sit, enjoy, discover some new truths. Matt Mayberry, welcome. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, Matthew. Thank you so much for having me. I'm ecstatic to join you today. You are very, very welcome. So what's it like being an NFL football player? It's very interesting. I, I would say my experience is, is much different from probably most former NFL players or even current NFL players. I would say mine was filled with a lot of sadness, heartbreak, and depression. Uh, my NFL career did not turn out or pan out the way I had envisioned. Uh, ever since the time I was about four or five years old, my parents can even attest to this, I always had a dream of being a professional athlete. In my heart of hearts, I thought that dream was gonna be playing in the major leagues. Uh, obviously for me and my journey, it turned out to be the game of football, but I got hurt my very first game. So my, my dream of having an eight to 10 year NFL career never panned out to the way I had envisioned. So I would say my experience was filled with a lot of sadness, heartbreak, but on the same side of that token, I'm very, very, very thankful and grateful for the experiences and really the life lessons that I accumulated from the game. Yeah. So you had this dream, you're pursuing this dream your whole life. You get there, you're in the NFL, and then you get injured. Um, as you say in your first game, how did you deal with that? You, you talk about sadness, the disappointment, the frustration, the um, even depression in the book. How did you deal with that? To be very honest, I didn't deal with it in the very beginning. You know, I, I really had a tendency to walk away from the sadness, the pain, the depression, the heartbreak, and, and really think about why me? That was my main focus. I started to participate in the blame game. I wanted to blame one of my teammates for being in the wrong place at the, at the wrong time. I wanted to blame the weather. I wanted to blame every single external circumstance that I could think of, rather than confronting reality head on. And I think for me, Matthew, what, what really, I think to give all of your, your listeners and viewers a little bit more perspective on why that particular injury was, was very damaging for me in my life, not only professionally, but also personally, is because when I was 16, I went through a drug addiction where I didn't even think that I was going to be able to come over that hardship throughout that course of my life. I hurt people that love me most, that I love most in life. Everybody in my entire life said that I was either going to be dead or in prison by the time I got to 18 years old. So finally, achieving a lifelong dream of making it as a professional athlete, or at least getting the opportunity to play at that level, and then getting injured in my very first game, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't just like a professional athlete experienced an injury, because football is a very violent physical sport. So when you hear of a football player getting injured, it's probably nothing out of the, the ordinary. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what happens in the game of football. But for me, it was just so compounded with with heartbreak and sadness and really the fear of change and the unknown I, I had no idea what was in store for me because because of my past when I was 16 17 years old th this was really that outlet for me to start building that bigger future for Matt Mayberry and that it really collapsed for me in my very first game yeah so you had this dream and then this dream died and you had to mourn this dream and then you had to move on with your life um, what was that period in your life like? You know, ultimately you become a very successful speaker and author. When, when did you realize, okay, that's what I'm going to do, or that's what I feel called to do? Absolutely. I, I think it ties into right into you know what you asked me in the previous question. How did I confront that reality head on? Um, and it ties to this question as well. And, and really for me, I think for about a year and a half. I kept running from the truth. I kept running away from, am I ever going to get the opportunity to play football again? And when, when that time finally came, when I realized that I had a conversation with my agent, who we had a very transparent conversation about my future of playing the game again, because quite frankly, I wasn't even able to run at this point. So I did start thinking about the possibilities of what's in store for my future. And really how I confronted it was, I still to this day don't know what it was because I had received a D in public speaking in college at Indiana University. So I, I was never a really naturally gifted communicator. And I was terrified to speak in front of a group of even 20 people. But I got asked to speak at a 
leadership event in downtown Chicago with Stedman Graham, Oprah Winfrey's boyfriend for well over 25 years. Um, and I confronted that pain and really th what was in store for my future by somehow, some way, overcoming my limitations and my fear of the unknown and saying yes to that opportunity and, and stepping into the, that unknown and stepping into that place of boldness and courageousness and, and going out there and speaking, even though that my, I was fearful for my life. Um, just speaking for 15 minutes, that really transitioned me into the career that I, I do now and have been doing for, quite frankly, 13 years now. So it was really just taking that next bold step and that next course of action, even if I wasn't able to see the full pathway ahead. Yeah, fantastic. Very inspiring. What, um, you know, your first book, um, Winning Plays, what led you to write the book? And, and, and what would you say is the main theme of the book? So what led me to write that book was one of my dear friends really challenged me because early on in my speaking career, I wasn't sharing the depths of my soul. I wasn't sharing my troubling past. I wasn't sharing the drug addiction. I wasn't sharing beating up my father when he confronted me about why I was coming home past curfew. I, I wasn't sharing the vulnerable aspects of who, what makes Matt Mayberry and who makes Matt Mayberry. And that friend who challenged me that particular day changed my life in a lot of ways. But really, that is what stemmed the conversations of even though I was very, very timid and frightful in the very beginning of that process of even thinking about sharing the intrinsic parts of my story and being vulnerable to that extent. That is really what prompted it. A friend sharing with me, he's seen numerous speaking engagements, seen me in the corporate sector, seen me with university football teams. And, he, and he, I'll never forget one particular event. He looked me directly in the eyes while we were having lunch after a, an engagement that he came with me uh, in Kentucky. And he looked me at, at me and said, you have more within you. And at first, I, I was so on a natural high from just speaking. I didn't know what he meant by that particular conversation. But as time went on, he continued to challenge me that I, was, I, I wasn't sharing my full self. I wasn't sharing my vulnerabilities and how that can make a difference and impact in other people's lives. So, so that's really what prompted me that one conversation with a very close friend of mine of writing the book, Winning Plays. And, and really the whole essence of that is, is sharing my adversities and challenges throughout the game of life and how that can really help the reader implement strategies and insights for their own game plan of life of how to navigate hardship and heartbreak and, and really turn those hardships and failures into great opportunities for their life got it it's been out for a while it's been a great success what is some of the feedback what do people say about the book what did they say helped them in reading the book i think the, the the number one takeaway i've received from readers was number one i think the ability to be just so transparent and and so vulnerable in sharing the depths of my story that quite frankly i'm still ashamed of to this day and embarrassed of but I think backing that up with not just sharing a story, it's not an autobiography of saying, look at me, look at what I've done or look at what I had overcome. Because quite frankly, a lot of my failures, Matthew, are and were self-induced. But I think being able to share some of those aspects of my life and journey that I'm so ashamed of, but being able to immediately implement back to the reader about how this could benefit their situation, a challenge that they're currently dealing with in their personal professional life. And, and quite frankly, Matthew, you're the person I have to thank for that, that ability. I'll never forget, you know, in the very beginning, uh, one of the very beginning parts of my journey, when I had a conversation with you and you were so gracious to give me your time and energy, you always referenced the ability to revert back to the audience as a speaker or the ability to revert back to the reader as an author. And I, I still, to this day, think about that 24 seven. Mm. So when you think about winning plays today, obviously when you wrote it, your first book, you're trying to make it happen. You're trying to make it um, work for the reader. Now, as you look back on it, and so many people have experienced it, is there like one type of person that you think, okay, this person absolutely has to read this book? Anybody that's currently dealing with some level of hardship or difficulty or adversity, or if your son or daughter is experiencing a difficulty or hardship, and you want to navigate on the best course of action on how to develop grit and keep moving and pressing forward, even if you don't see a pathway forward, that is who that book is for. 
Fantastic. You, um, you recently released uh, your second book, uh, which is about culture. And I know writing the first book was a big thing for you. I, I think it was, it's something that um, took a lot of time, took a lot of energy. I know you wanted it to be excellent. I know that um, these projects are easy to abandon sometimes because they do feel like Mount Everest. Um, how did you feel when you set out to write your second book? You know, I felt, <laughs> I wish I could say I felt better, but I'd be lying to you if I said that. Um, I, I think as you can attest, I think every book that you set out to write is a, it's a journey. I, I think that it's a process. There's one filled that is with, with enthusiasm, filled with excitement, filled with passion, but also filled with fear. You know, I think, how is this book going to be received? Is this book going to make a difference? Is this book going to be of, you know, as big of an impact as I think it's going to be? But I think every great creator deals with that you know, some level of those self-limitating thoughts. Uh, for me, though, I would say the, the journey of writing culture is the way was what much more enjoyable than winning plays. And part of that is because in winning plays, I was sharing more vulnerabilities and parts of my story that, as I mentioned, still to this day, I'm very, very ashamed of. So culture is the way. Sometimes I feel like with these books, people look at them and say, oh, that's only for the highest leader in the organization, or that's not for me because I'm not in business, or that's not for me because I can't influence the culture. Talk a little bit about that. Talk about who should read this book and what impact you hope it will have on them. Yeah, absolutely. And fantastic question. I, I think there's no doubt about it that this book is for C-suite leaders and, and executives and, and really, quite frankly, any people manager. Uh, that has direct reports or that manages people in some capacity. But with that being said, I think that you are right. It's, it's one of the big misconceptions is that if, hey, I'm not the CEO or the COO or the VP of sales, I have no direct impact on the culture within my company or within my organization. And that is just completely false. You know, I think one thing that I'm a big believer in, I think the game of football is such a great teacher of this is doing the next right thing in this particular moment, consistently adding up little wins day in and day out. And the best way that I like to look at it is everybody wants to be a part of a winning, great, healthy, and thriving environment. So you know, why leave it up to it? that's so-and-so's job or that's the leader's job? Because quite frankly, is that even if you don't have a title now, leadership is not you know predicated on your particular title or what the company's website has you on in your biography. Leadership is a level of influence and impact on another human being. And yes. quite frankly, we all have the ability and capacity to influence and impact another human being every single day of our lives, whether we have the role and title of a leader or not. So I think that's number one. I think the, the second part of your question is the main thing I want the reader to get out of this particular book is A, the true, true importance of culture. Because one of the things I talk about in the book is the misconceptions of culture, right? A lot of times people think culture and they confuse it with perks, right? Getting off at 3.45 p.m. on a Tuesday, not having a manager or leader that challenges me in a healthy way. Um, and, and quite frankly, having sleep pods on every level of the company's headquarters. Those are perks, not culture, yep. right? One of the things I talk about in the book is, you know, culture is truly behavior at scale. How are the people within an organization behaving when the CEO is not present? And, and, and so the number one thing I want the reader to get away is, number one, the importance and value of culture. Number two, under truly understanding the misconceptions that are connected to culture. And then third, how you can truly make a difference. In the book, I, I share five steps to really building a world-class culture that I've utilized in my management consulting practice. Uh, and those five steps have just reaped unbelievable levels of impact and influence throughout organizations, both medium and large size entities. I want to come back to the five steps, but before we get into that, I want to ask you something. Do you find you're out there on the road, you're speaking, you're consulting. Um, do you find that leaders say, yes, culture is important, but then deprioritize it? Do you find that leaders say culture is very important, but then discover they're not willing to invest in it, they don't want to spend time and money on it, and they just expect it to happen on their own? Uh, or have you had a different experience to that? Every every single day of my life, every single day of my life, I think that in some way, shape, or form, whether it's a conversation that I directly have with a leader, 
or if I'm at a company's headquarters and at a, you know, all staff meeting and see a leader get in front of their people and go to different departments within the organization and say, this is what our culture is, and this is how important it is, and this is how we're going to prioritize it. And then the very next week, go back and do something. Their actions don't consistently align with what they're communicating to the rest of the organization. And, and that right there just erodes and, and destroys any momentum that they had. So every single day of my life, I experienced that. And, and quite frankly, one of the five steps in five steps to building a world-class culture that I have in Culture is the Way uh, is leaders blaze the trail. And that's actually step number five. But quite frankly, that could be number one. So if there's a leader listening to this and they've read the book, maybe maybe they haven't read the book, they're going to pick up a copy today. Um, what would you encourage them to do as a first step? What would you encourage them just to, to get some momentum going? How would you encourage them to do that? Before you open your mouth and communicate anything to the rest of the organization or with your team or even with other team members, even if it's an individual conversation, make sure you're also looking in the mirror and asking, am I living this particular mandate, expectation, or behavior every single day? I, I think that's number one. I, I think a lot of times leaders massively, massively underestimate their level of influence. Everything they say, everything they do, how they treat others, Everything they do every single day, every day of the week throughout that organization, people are looking to them on how to behave, how to think, and what to do in every given situation. Yeah. Are there other mistakes that you see leaders making all the time when it comes to culture? Enormously underestimating how long it takes to cultivate and really foster a thriving culture. I think a lot of leaders look at, you know, like right now, there's so many organizations are going through digital transformations and looking at how is AI going to continually revolutionize business. And a lot of times there are initiatives where, hey, there's a start date and an end date. But in the book, I talk about there's a start date, but there is no end date with culture. It is a continual evolution. It is a continual pursuit to excellence and greatness. And every single day, uh, there has to be a level of setting a high standard. And every single day, trying to jump over that standard with your level of commitment for actions and everything that you do as a leader. So I think that really underestimating how long it takes, because quite frankly, in my work, and I'd be curious to see what you've seen in your work, you know, really, quite frankly, I think it's about two to three years to really shift a culture, change a culture, tweak a culture, and really start that process to build a world-class culture. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And I think people and organizations have short attention spans. Um, it's interesting because at Floyd, we, I will go in and train people around culture, or we will do an ongoing consulting scenario around culture. Um, yeah. And I know you do very similar work. And that's, that's why I bring it up, because what I see is the companies that say, hey, come in and teach us about this, and then we'll take it from here. You know, if we circle back 12 months from now, chances are that initiative is dead in, in north of 50% of companies. And, and after two years, it will be dead in north of 80% of companies. Um, I have a very firm belief that if you really want to affect culture, you need an external party holding you accountable to, even if they're only holding you accountable to keep it going and, and to continue to um, stay focused in it in, in the long run. Um, are you seeing similar things in the clients you're working with, the businesses you're working with? A hundred percent, hundred percent, Matthew. I mean, I think to even piggyback off of that comment, it's not only with culture, it's with everything. You know, it's with, let's say, an organization, they want their leaders to develop into coaches. Or let's say that, you know, an organization wants more accountability uh, throughout its, its managers, right? I mean, regardless of what an organization wants to do, look at a football team, right? And, and let's use the NFL as an example. Every Sunday, every Monday night, every Thursday, you know, there, there's the game. Right. But what happens in between that? What happens in the off season? Right. There's a continual evolution of practice and refining their skill set and their craft. You know, ask a Navy SEAL. Right. If there's training involved, ask yep. a police commander if there's training involved. Right. I mean, I, I think every every great organization, every great leader knows that there has to be a certain level of commitment and intentionality to training. 
when it comes to culture, but also really anything that you want to bring to life and cultivate throughout your organization. Yeah, it's very true. Um, what, without mentioning the clients, but because I know there's confidentiality involved there, but what type of clients are your favorite clients to work with? What qualities do they all share as individual leaders or as, as organizations? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I would say that most of the clients, you know, what they share in common, I would say it's, it's medium to large size companies, um, both public and private sector. I, I think the number one thing that they share, though, is there's a strong level of commitment to want to get better. Uh, and, and there's a boldness and a courageous ambition but they don't necessarily have the game plan or course of action on the pathway forward currently set in place. And I say that because most, let's, let's use large organizations, for example, they think they know it all, right? Yep. We've, we've already done this. We do a hundred billion annually every single year. This is what we've done in the past. We have the 35 year historic, you know, history of the, who the company is and what all the great things that we've done. Right. And, and I think that that level of boldness and courageousness oftentimes that can be a complacency trap for many organizations. Yes. So as great as they are in the marketplace, right? What they have is sure, medium to large size entities. They have those bold ambitions, but, but there is some form of level of complacency. And that's where I try to really insert myself and challenge their ideas. I think one of my gifts is being able to challenge C-suite executive leaders who do have the 30, 20 year experience and are incredibly accomplished but being able to come in a way in a very authentic way of challenging their ideas and really the pathway forward, because especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, the workplace dynamics of the future and even presently right now here in this moment are yes. completely different than what they were 10 to 20 years ago. So I would say if there's one thing that they have in common, it's, it's medium to large size companies who have bold, courageous ambitions, but there is some form of level of complacency and they don't have that course plan of action currently set in place to meet up to those standards of excellence that they have for the future. Got it. Yeah, it's interesting, those big successful companies. I say to the team all the time here, I say success will hide almost anything. And, um, <laughs> and complacency is just one of those things. But really, success can, can blind us to so many things. And an organization that is very successful, um, I think, has to look at itself um, much, much harder and much, much closer than the ones that are um, just getting along. Absolutely. In culture is the way, and, and you referenced them earlier, you talk about these five steps. Do you have a favorite of the five steps? Yeah, uh, absolutely, I do. And those five steps are, you know, define your culture. And the second one, discover through collaboration and inspiration. Uh, the third one is launch, cascade, embed. The fourth is driving long-term impact. And the fifth one that we already touched on is leaders blaze the trail. Uh, as I already mentioned, the fifth one could probably be number one, but how I lay it out in the book, number one is my absolute favorite, and that is to find your culture. I, I talk about the example, if you find 30 employees at, let's say, an annual convention somewhere, and you ask those 30 employees, what is the culture that work at the same company? What is the culture of your company? you're probably nine out of 10 times going to get 29 different responses. Yep. And, and one of the examples I use in the book is that how some of the best builders of culture are football coaches. I really believe that to the depths of my soul. I really believe that Nick Saban, Bill Belichick can maybe go into a large size organization and they could put the pieces around them that know the industry, that know the business, and they can move that thing forward with a compelling vision of the future and build the right culture to sustain the behavior moving forward. Um, and, but one thing all great football programs do is they define the culture of their program. They define the culture. And I talk about when I was at Indiana University, my coach, who I learned everything I know about leadership and culture, and uh, his, his name was Coach Terry Hepner. You know, our culture was get better today. It was predicated on this idea of we want to win a championship. We want to do this and we want to win this amount of games and we want to you know, the, this is the offensive stats we want, and the defensive stats that we want. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is every single day, are we getting a little bit better and maximizing our effort, intensity, and commitment to getting better in the process? Mm -hmm. and, and so this whole theme of get better today, from the outside looking in, you might not be able to resonate with that, or you might say that is vague, but internally, 
we knew exactly what that meant. We were graded by that. We, we, we studied film by that standard. I mean, everything we did from practice to conditioning to weight training, that theme of get better today, that mantra, that, that culture was embedded in almost everything that we do it was on our shorts, on our shirts. So I really use the example of you have to define your culture. And looking in the business world, um, you know, you, you see a lack of, there, there is no defined culture. There, like I use the example of if you see 30 employees and you ask them, what is the culture here? You are going to get 29 different responses at least nine out of 10 times. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, your coach gave you such a great gift, gave all those young men such a great gift because it, um, it, it is universally applicable to every aspect of our life, right? You know, right, whether absolutely. we're thinking about our marriage, get better today. Think about parenting, get better today thinking about your health and well-being or your personal finances or your career or the work or a project, get better today. It, it applies to everything. And so I think that is um, incredibly powerful. I agree that um, corporations and organizations have not defined culture. And the result of that is because, you know, it gets defined by default. And, right. um, and as a result of that, it has become defined, as you referenced or alluded to earlier in the conversation, it has become defined by these um, fads and personal preferences and um, various types of creative benefits that really have nothing to do with culture. You know, they may nothing. be good for people, they may be good for uh, the business, but it isn't culture. It's it's um, it's a it's a smokescreen, I think, to to really taking a look at what is culture. And as you say, defining culture. Number four, um, you talk about driving a long-term impact. Um, I thought it was interesting when I read it, um, you know, it isn't driving long-term profits. And I think that there are a lot of leaders out there who believe that culture and profits are at odds with each other. They believe that if they spend time and money building a great culture, their business will become less profitable. Um, I know you don't agree with that. I know I don't agree with that, but I want to give you a moment to talk about that and, and tell me your thoughts on that. You know, it's, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And I think that there, there are so many leaders that think that I have to choose one or the other, right? Do we want to build a winning, thriving, very profitable organization? Or do we want to build a culture, right? And I think hopefully what I've been able to do throughout the book and that at least my mission, my one of my core missions was that they are not, in, you know, they're not competing with one another. As a matter of fact, culture, right? Culture is really the DNA. It is the mechanism to accelerate your growth and impact in the marketplace, to be more profitable, to yep. build a more thriving, fulfilling workplace where, where people truly love coming to work every single day. And I think- the, the, the fourth step of the, the five steps to build a world-class culture, it's really predicated on what I mentioned with Coach Terry Hepner about how we took that, that theme of get better today, and it was really embedded in everything that we did as a football program, everything that we did. Because I think that, you know, you've seen this, right? An organization will get together at a strategic offsite meeting at the end of the year and say, hey, here are our core values. We have a culture. Right. They put them up on the website. They have them plastered all throughout the walls at the company's headquarters. But those values are they're meaningless because oftentimes they're not lived. And oftentimes, even those values, even if they're noble and inspirational in a way, there's no clear mechanism for what is a concise, direct behavioral statement that is attached to that value, letting your people know on how they can cultivate and live that value every single day. Exactly right. So, so, so that the fourth step in the five steps to build a world class culture that I lay out in the book, it's it's really all about embedding that culture, whatever that culture is for your organization or for your company or for your entity, right? It is embedding it in every deep layer part of that organization, right? Because there's a lot of organizations. I'm working with one company right now, and about a year and a half ago, in the beginning parts of the journey, they started to say that they had a no jerk policy. Right. It, it doesn't matter that if you're a high performer, if you're the greatest salesperson, we have a no jerk policy. Right. We want to build an organization and cultivate an environment where, where people respect each other and that we put our values front and center. Well, it turns out 
there was a high performer who happened to be a jerk. And as three months went by, this person continually disrespected people. This person continually didn't show up on time to meetings. This person continually pushed away initiatives that were handed to him that everyone else had to do. And, and guess what the leaders of that organization did in the very beginning of that? Nothing was done. So, so that part, what kind of message does that send? Regardless of what you say during an all-company meeting or what you may send out in a memo to your employees, if you have a no-jerk policy and every single day you're talking about the no-jerk policy, but you have a high performer who is a jerk still around, you yep. send a much bigger message than what's on, what's on your website, what's in your memos, or what is communicated during the all-company meeting. So the, the fourth step is so incredibly important because you may start the process of building a culture, but we don't want this momentum to just last for three months or six months. We want to build an organization that cultivates greatness day in and day out and does it for decades and eternity and builds a legacy where people know that organization for that particular thing. Yeah. I know you're headed to Singapore soon to speak a million dollar round table. Um, how are you feeling about that trip and, and, and what are you planning to speak about? You know, I'm feeling, feeling great. I, I don't know if I'm feeling great for the 23 hour flight, but uh, I'm feeling great <laughs> for the opportunity. Um, I, I remember when I first started my journey, I, I mentioned to you before we got online here, uh, that you always told me if there's one stage to get on, it is million dollar round table. So, you know, I'm really, 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 truly excited for the opportunity. And my presentation is actually focused on high performance in a rapidly changing world. So um, regardless of the, the cultural dynamics that will be represented at this particular event in Singapore, uh, everybody has experienced change, right? Every country has experienced change to some degree, especially since the pandemic. So, so my presentation um, as you know, it, it, 20 minutes compared to 60 or 90 minutes is much different, but it's really going to be focused on three key ideas on high performance, regardless of what our environment or circumstances uh, present in front of us. Fantastic. Matt, it's so good to be with you. Hope to have you back sometime. If you're ever in the area, we'd love to sit down in the studio and do a, a more extended um, conversation, but we'll wish you the best, um, especially with the new book and uh, travel safe. I know you're on the road a lot and look forward to our paths crossing again soon. Matthew, thank you so much for having me. And I'd actually regret this if I didn't say it here on air during this uh, podcast. You changed my life. For all the listeners and viewers, uh, when, when I, we, we talked about me getting hurt in the NFL and I, I had no clear pathway for what was in store for my future, I sent an email to Matthew Kelly. Uh, I read The Rhythm of Life during that very dark time in my life, that period. Uh, and that book changed my life. That book changed my life. If you haven't read The Rhythm of Life, please, please read it. Uh, but I, I would regret it if I didn't say it on this interview, Matthew. You changed my life. Uh, and I, I truly love and respect the work you do and who you are as a person. So from, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for who you are. And thank you for having me on. Uh, you're very welcome. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you, Matthew.